Please welcome to the stage Mike Driquez, Israeli Deputy Consul General, for the prayer for the State of Israel. Please join me with your hearts and your thoughts. We really need this this day. אבינו שבשמיים, צור ישראל וגואלו, ברך את מדינת ישראל ראשית צמיחת גאולתנו. הגן עליה בעברת חסדיך, ופרוס עליה סוכת שלומיך, ושלח אורך ואמיתך לראשיה, שריה ויועציה, ותקנם בעצה טובה מלפניך. חזק ידי מגני ארץ קודשנו, ונחילי מלואנו ישועה ועטרת ניצחון תיעתרם. ונתת שלום בארץ ושמחת עולם ליושביה, ואת אחינו כל בית ישראל וקודנה בכל ארצות פזוריהם, ותוליכם מהרה קוממיות לציון עיריך ולירושלים משכן שמך, ככתוב בתורת משה עבדיך, אם יהיה נידחך בקצה השמיים, משם יקבצך אדוני אלוהיך ומשם יקחך, ואביאך אדוני אלוהיך אל הארץ אשר ירשו אבותיך וירשתה, ואת יפך וירבך מאבותיך, ויחד לבבנו לאהבה ולראה את שמך ולשמוע את כל דברי תורתך. ושלח לנו מהרה בן דוד משיח צדקך, לפדות מחכה קץ ישועתך. הופעה באדר גאונו זכה, על כל יושבי תבל ארצך, ויאמר כל אשר נשמה באפו, אדוני אלוהי ישראל מלך ומלכותו בכל משלה, אמן סלע. My pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 ZOA Florida Heroes for Israel Gala. The size and positive energy in this crowd are true testaments to tonight's honorees and the impact of this incredible organization that I am so proud to represent under the fierce leadership of National President Morton Klein. We're thrilled to be honoring Zionist hero, the great one, Mark Levin. And we are so blessed with outstanding heroes for Israel within our community, Light Unto Nations Synagogue Ward. Let's hear it for Boca Raton Synagogue under the leadership of Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg. Thank you to our gala co-chair and national board member, Daniel and Caroline Katz. And what a tremendous honor to have with us this evening, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy. quite an evening ahead of us. I want to take a moment and thank all of our generous gala sponsors who you'll see listed in your programs. ZOA's crucial work must expand. It's because of you, our hero sponsors, and all of our supporters, all of you here in this room tonight, that, we can, that ZOA can be present wherever and whenever ZOA's voice of truth is needed. I want to recognize those who are part of ZOA's national team who are with us tonight. ZOA Florida board members who are with us, raise your hand. Thank you. Co-chair of the ZOA national board, Dr. Paul Tartell. National board members, Cheryl Silver, Jim Pollack, Larry Magid. Leonard Getz and Bob Gazzardi. Also from ZOA National, we have Nancy Hollander and Alan Jay. And a big thank you to the top-notch security team we have here. Let's hear it for all of our law enforcement.
finally, our Diamond Hero sponsors and co-chair of this amazing event, Helene and Louis Stahl. What you do for Israel and what you bring to the South Florida community is truly immeasurable. Helene and Louis, you are each leaders in your own rights and together you make the ultimate power couple for furthering the causes of Israel and Zionism that all of us here in this room care so deeply about. It has been a true pleasure working with you on this historic evening. Please help me welcome to the stage Gala Co-Chair Louis Stahl. especially with the speaker here tonight. Well, this is the Zionist Organization of America. What else can we say? What we see in front of us is our ongoing miracle. I'm Yisrael Chazak, Chai Chazak. We are not only living, we're alive and we're strong. Our joint nations of the United States and Israel and our peoples are alive, strong, and united, and we're growing in strength. It is true, we do have an incredible evening ahead of us. Helene and I have been honored to be part of ZOA, both in Florida and New York. We have elected officials and dignitaries with us this evening, in addition to those who will be on stage tonight. Our close and dear friend, Congressman Brian Mast, Congress, Congressman Carlos Jimenez, Florida State Rep Demi Tara Busanta, who I don't know but I have to get to know, our friend Broward Circuit Court Judge Michael Davis, I haven't seen him but I think he is, and Deputy Consul General of Israel who was just up here, Mike Driguez. And all of us have in common our love for our country and for the Jewish state of Israel. Please turn your attention to the screens to learn more about ZOA. For 124 years, the Zionist Organization of America has stood firm as the Jewish people's most reliable ally and protector. ZOA led the fight in the U.S. to re-establish the Jewish state five generations ago. In the 20th century, it stood by Israel as the young country matured into a leading nation on the world stage despite all odds. Today, under the 28-year stewardship of Morton Klein, ZOA flourishes as a nonpartisan advocate for a strong U.S.-Israel alliance, Israel's unequivocal right to defend herself, and dismantling policies that threaten Israel's safety and Jewish life. Anti-Israel rhetoric and overt anti-Semitic attacks have risen to alarming levels. On college campuses, on social media, in corporate boardrooms, and even halls of government, open malice toward the state of Israel has become the new normal. The winds of change demand ZOA's unflinching support for the Jewish state now more than ever before. ZOA brings the fight for Israel to four main arenas, media and education, government advocacy, student support, and law and justice. The message about Zionism and anti-Israel bias has been clear and consistent for decades. Promote the truth about Israel's right to its land, its claim to Jerusalem, and the morality of its actions in the face of violent threats. Among its nonpartisan positions, ZOA has long held that an undivided Jerusalem and Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, is just, and that a two-state solution would create a substantial terrorist threat. Media appearances, leadership programs, events, and educational initiatives organized by the ZOA influence the global community toward greater appreciation for the modern state of Israel and its accomplishments. ZOA has earned the unparalleled trust of high-ranking officials in both the U.S. and Israeli governments through years of relationship building. Full-time ZOA professionals meet with senators and congressmen to lobby for the issues that are important to both countries. 
Notably, ZOA publicly opposed the Oslo Accords, Gaza withdrawal, and Iran deal, while pushing for the U.S. Embassy's move to Jerusalem and recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. ZOA officials routinely testify before Congress on key issues such as anti-BDS legislation and run awareness campaigns to support the appointment of pro-Israel officials and combat those hostile to Israel. Over 100 campuses across the country are served by ZOA community building events, speaker series, mentoring groups, educational programs, seminars, and student trips to Israel. In an effort to promote healthy discourse around Zionism and Israel, ZOA President Morton Klein has personally traveled to a number of major universities for speaking engagements to tell the truth about Israel and encourage thoughtful debate among Jewish and non-Jewish students. By training the next generation to effectively advocate for Israel and refute the anti-Zionist propaganda flooding campuses, ZOA works to ensure that students feel safe and proud to express their Jewish identity and Zionism at college. In 2002, ZOA established the Center for Law and Justice to defend Israel in the courts, litigating the most complex lawsuits on behalf of Jewish students, terror victims, Jerusalem's legal status, and other cases with ripple effects for Israeli citizens and Jews across the world. ZOA led the groundbreaking fight to reinterpret Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to protect Jewish students against discrimination, has filed numerous amicus briefs with the Supreme Court to clarify anti-Jewish policies, and fought for Israel to be listed as the birthplace on U.S. passports for citizens born in Jerusalem. The Zionist Organization of America's founders dreamt of peace and dignity for the Jewish people in their rightful homeland. 124 years later, ZOA is stronger than ever. But the fight for Israel's future is still on, and we're not slowing down anytime soon. Please welcome Dr. Paul Tartel, ZOA National Co-Chair. Pretty amazing, huh? And that video only barely scratches the surface. Thank you for joining us and supporting our mission, the operative word being our. This is your organization, and we're proud to represent it. Ever since ZOA was founded over 125 years ago, it's been at the forefront of all issues concerning Jews and Israel. Out of all the organizations in our cohort, ZOA is by far the most influential and consequential, owing to the tireless efforts of Mort Klein, our iconic national president, and also to our extraordinary staff, who you've had the pleasure of seeing tonight. Here at ZOA, we are relentless and unapologetic in our tenacious advocacy for the Jewish people in Israel. When necessary, we sound the clarion and unabashedly speak out on all relevant issues. When other groups cower and defer, or even capitulate, we definitively say what needs to be said, however unpopular or against the grain of the powers that be. We view the world as it is, not as how we wish it to be. If the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, we'll point it out. And then we'll even further expose and clarify for those who either cannot or will not see. Neither timidity nor political correctness restrain us. We cannot be deterred and never sacrifice substance for style. We always tell it like it is, however uncomfortable or controversial. We're passionately and resolutely committed to our mission and despite our relatively small size, even our detractors begrudgingly admit that we are the most effective and important advocacy group in our niche. We are both feared and respected, and we've been proven right time and again. But as good a job as we've been doing, we can even do better. There is so much that we have to do, there is so much that we can do, 
and there is so much more that we plan to do if only we had a bigger war chest. By virtue of your being here, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You've generously, generously supported us, and for that, we are grateful. Pound for pound, we are the most efficient and effective Jewish advocacy group uh, in our cohort. We punch well above our weight, but could do even better with greater resources. And that's why we're appealing to you for more support. We live in challenging socioeconomic and geopolitical times with anti-Semitism on the rise and Israel fraught with existential threats from foreign and domestic foes. I shudder to think how much worse it would be without a strong ZOA to confront and battle our anti-Semitic world that irrationally and vehemently hate Jews and Israel. A world of dysfunctional nations and international organizations that treat Israel not as a sovereign state, but as a vassal state, with the chutzpah to lecture Israel as to what to do and how to do it. The glass house irony is palpable and reprehensible. While in diaspora for thousands of years, Jews were defenseless strangers in strange lands, perennial minorities at the mercy of host nations and leaders who periodically banished them or worse. That fundamentally changed with the establishment, or re-establishment, I should say, of Israel. And as long as ZOA is around, Israel will be defended to make it and the Jewish people more safe and secure. For Jews who have little or no relationship to Judaism or Israel, who already think that they're in their promised land, one only needs to be reminded of the assimilated Jews in 1930s Germany who felt exactly the same way. The past is prologue. It can happen again. Just look at France, where Jews have been tacitly expelled, leaving in droves because anti-Semitism has become intolerable and made it unsafe to stay there any longer. When asked to do this donor appeal, I immediately thought of an old temptation song. I, too, ain't too proud to beg. So please, 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 I beg of you, give as much as you can. We can't do this all by ourselves. We desperately need all of your help. So uh, this is the point where I think some of you actually already figured it out already, which is great. But if you take your name tags and you flip them over, you'll see this QR code. And if you take your smartphone camera, you're probably better at this than I am, you just sort of take a picture of it and you'll get to the website that will get you towards our donor page. And uh, you can uh, hopefully, uh, as we go along, uh, feel free to donate. Donate multiple times if you can. It's like voting in Chicago, I guess. Vote often and vote early. Uh, please give. Please give generously. Please give as much as you can. It will go to good use, I promise you. Your, co your, your contribution will flash across the, scre the screen, and uh, it could either be accompanied by your name, or if you choose to be anonymous, you can do so as well. So please help us continue to fill the void in Jewish advocacy. ZOA is the only organization that will always stand up for Jews and Israel. We are it. There are no others. We have so much to do. Please join us in contributing as much as you can. Every bit counts. I promise you, you won't regret it. We are responsible stewards for your money, and it will be the best ROI you ever get. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Anti-Semitism is at historically high levels in the US and around the world. Understanding anti-Semitism in all its forms is the first step to effectively addressing this serious problem. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance IRA working definition of anti-Semitism is being adopted by a growing number of municipalities and counties throughout Florida, in addition to the state of Florida, the US State Department, and over 30 countries and others. It serves as a powerful tool to combat anti-Semitism as it helps identify the different types of Jew hatred, including the way we see it most commonly manifest today, especially on social media and college campuses as relates to Israel. 
ZOA Florida has been reaching out to municipalities throughout the state, urging them to adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. We've seen a lot of success in this effort, and we look forward to more. Consul General of Israel, Maor Elbaz Dorinsky, please join me on stage to recognize and thank the municipalities that have adopted the IRA definition. What Sharona just shared is an important effort that the Israeli consulate is proud to be part of. You have in your blue bags at your table the list of municipalities in the, sta in the state of Florida that have adopted the IRA definition. We thank all those that are part of this list and would like to see this list grow. If your city is missing from this list, let's get it added. I believe we have a couple of mayors and commissioners with us this evening from the cities and counties on the list. Please stand up to be recognized, and please hold your applause until the end, as much as it's hard. Miami-Dade County Commissioner Kevin Marino Cabrera. Where are you, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin? Maybe he left. Mayor of Surfside, Shlomo Danziger. <laughs> Mayor of Sunny Isles, Larissa Svechin. <laughs> Aventura Commissioner Paul Cruz. Paul. Former Mayor of Palm Beach County, Robert Wainworth. <laughs> Former Mayor of Ball Harbor, Gabriel Grossman. Gabe. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you very much, all. Please welcome to the stage Gala Co Chair Caroline Katz. Boca Raton Synagogue is receiving the ZOA Florida Light Unto the Nations Synagogue Award, and it has everything to do with Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg's leadership. He has led and inspired his congregation to get involved with Zionist activities, providing educational opportunities to learn more and advocate on behalf of Israel. Other rabbis should take note of Rabbi Goldberg's leadership when it comes to Israel. We need more rabbis like you, Rabbi Goldberg, to motivate communities to show up and stand up when we need to come together for Israel, just as BRS does. This is an award for the entire Boca Raton Synagogue congregation. As a member of Boca Raton Synagogue, I am very proud and honored to present this award. Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, Please come to the stage to accept the ZOA Florida Light Unto the Nations Synagogue Award on behalf of our congregation, Boca Raton Synagogue. It reads, Light Unto the Nations Synagogue Award presented to Boca Raton Synagogue under the leadership of Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg for unconditionally and proudly standing up for Israel as a community. Caroline, thank you for those exceedingly kind words. You and Daniel are an inspiration to all of us. And we're so grateful and proud for your leadership in our community and through the ZOA and so much else that you do. I stand up here really only representing our incredible community, the Boca Raton Synagogue, who I'm so honored to serve as one of the rabbis. And we as a community are so honored for this recognition and to partner with the ZOA at the front lines of fighting for the Jewish people and fighting for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship and for the one and only Jewish state, for the state of Israel. An enormous thank you to Sharona for all the hard work that went into this beautiful evening. Thank you to Mort. We've had the privilege to host Mort many times and to know him for many years. 
You're an inspiration, your passion, your tenacity, your fearlessness. Thank you for all of the fight that you do for the Jewish people regularly. I'm proud tonight to be here with so many members of the Boca Raton Synagogue, included among them my parents who raised me and my siblings, the other two of which have made Aliyah and live in Israel, to be proud Zionists, to stand with Israel, and to fight for Israel. I'm proud to be here tonight with two of my daughters, Tamara and Esti, to wish Esti a happy birthday. Today is her 16th birthday. And while we appreciate the recognition this evening, we realize it's just the beginning of the work that all of us have to do. In only a week from now, we're going to mark and celebrate the holiday of Pesach, of Passover, which marks the miraculous story of the exodus from Egypt. And we spend that night telling that story, regaling in the miracles, and looking in our own personal narrative and story, the journey of the miracles in our lives. But it is critically important to recognize that Passover is not the story of freedom from. It's not just the story of being liberated from tyranny and persecution and oppression. It is the story of freedom to, freedom to a Jewish people and a Jewish homeland that are to be a light to the nations, that are to transform and redeem the world, that are contribute positively in every which way. And we know that is why all of us stand so firmly with Israel, the only liberal democracy in the Middle East that stands side by side with the United States, sharing so many interests and making the world such a better place. The story of Passover reminds us not just to celebrate freedom from, the freedom that we have, but the responsibility that comes with that freedom. And so there is so much to do as Jews stand at the precipice of the rise of anti-Semitism. And that Israel is such a complicated time, both from without and from within. Boker Tone Synagogue community, together with the ZOA and all of you, part pledge and promise to continue this partnership to fight at the front lines for that strong, safe, and secure Israel, and to continue to try to transform, repair, and redeem the world to be a better place. Wishing everyone a happy Passover. Thank you for this great honor. Thank you, Rabbi Goldberg. And mazel tov again to the Boca Raton Synagogue on this well-deserved honor. Please welcome to the stage National Leadership Society member, Robert Meyer. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. When 14 student groups at the University of California in Berkeley banned anyone who supports Israel's right to exist from speaking, Representative Kevin McCarthy issued a powerful condemnation of this blatant anti-Semitism. Before Representative Kevin McCarthy's successful election this year, as the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, he vowed to remove Representative Ilan Omar from her position He vowed to remove Representative Ilan Omar from her position on the House Foreign Affairs Committee because of her anti-Semitic criticism of Israel. Speaker Kevin McCarthy kept his promise. <laughs> Speaker McCarthy also urged President Biden to instruct the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations to veto all one-sided UN Security Council anti-Israel anti resolutions. Anti 
This was the long-standing policy of the United States until former President Obama allowed the passage of Security Re Council Resolution 2334, which sought to erase the Jewish connection to the land of Israel. Speaker McCarthy uses his voice and influence to strengthen the U.S.-Israel relationship. And for this, we are extremely grateful to you, Mr. Speaker. It is a true honor to invite to the stage Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Kevin Owen McCarthy. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much. It is an honor to be here. And I'm here for two reasons. One, because of the respect I have for this organization. So many times when we're in a fight in Congress, it's only ZOA who stands with us when we're standing for Israel. This is not a moment in time. We shouldn't worry about hurting people's feelings. We should stand up for what's right and what's wrong. And you do it every single time. Thank you. The other reason I'm here is to name the Zionist Hero Award. I'm here because of the person you selected. There is no greater voice in America today, no stronger voice for freedom through the radio, through television, through books, and the man we'll honor tonight, Mark Levin. Now, it's an honor to be here. I see so many friends. So many friends that I've got to know because of the bond of creating U.S. and Israel relationships even greater. I get to serve with some amazing people. Some of them are here tonight. Carlos and Lordy Jimenez. Who have stood with Israel, but I'm proud to say we have walked in Israel together firsthand, and I appreciate that. Now, I get to travel the country a lot, and I get embarrassed at times when I go to certain districts because some of these members are so much better than I, and I happen to be in one right now when I stand with Brian Mass. <laughs> Brian Mass serves on foreign affairs, transportation, and others, but he is such one of the strongest voices around. And I want to tell you a little personal story. I would say if we didn't give the award to Mark Levin, we should give it to Brian. I don't know, you probably already won it, I'm not sure. But every new Congress, I bring all the Republican freshmen to Israel. When Brian was a freshman, we're in Israel, and we go in to meet the Prime Minister, Bibi. And Bibi brings me back. And we're talking while everyone's sitting out there, and I think, Oh, B.B.'s excited to see me again. No, he had a question for me. Where's Brian Mass? <laughs> and I thought, well, how do you know Brian? He goes, because I sent him a letter. You sent him a letter? Why? Because I sent him a letter to thank him. Well, why'd you send him a letter to thank him? Because Brian, after serving and sacrificing for us in America, he signed up and served with the IDF. With all these other members standing there, a man that sacrificed and gave physically of his body continued to fight, went to Israel because he knew where freedom stood. Bibi walked 
beyond all the other members and walked to the back where Brian was sitting humbly, shook his hand and said, thank you again. That's the man you have here. To Mort, thank you for your voice. Thank you for being strong. Thank you for not bending. And thank you for standing up each and every time. It makes a difference. Now you're here because you care about Israel. I'm proud to say my first foreign trip as Speaker of the House will be for the 75th anniversary of Israel. And I will... And I'll be the first speaker since Newt to give a speech at the Knesset. And I will bring as many members that want to come on both sides of the aisle so we show the strength and the support as we go. I will say this, I am concerned about the anti-Semitism that continues to grow. I'm shocked when I see it in other countries, but I'm more shocked when I see it in America. On college campuses, but when I heard it spoken in the halls of Congress, not by a protester, but by a member elected, I pledged that I would remove her from foreign affairs. It was amazing to me the language she used as a member of Congress. She thought we wouldn't do it. It was only the weekend before she realized she said something that could have been construed to be wrong. I think when we voted and removed her, she understood. But I hope we sent a message, not to the rest of America, but also to the rest of the world, that we will not stand for anti-Semitism anti anywhere, and especially in the halls of Congress. And we will continue. But I'm proud what we have worked together. We have accomplished a lot. We kept our promise and moved the embassy to the true capital of Israel, Jerusalem. We led the historic Abraham Accords between Israel and many Arab nations, opening the door. We officially recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And under President Trump's leadership, we launched a maximum pressure campaign against the evil Islamic Republic of Iran. And of course, the list goes on. Now I know I'm not supposed to get political, so I won't, but there's a, but there's a difference in administrations of what we're able to do. So that's why we need people on the front lines. That's why we need voices that are willing to speak. Tonight, we gather to celebrate our successes and, importantly, to honor a friend. Unapologetic support has made many of them possible. And that's Mark Levin. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher always said, you win the argument before you win the vote. It's not the argument in Congress that always just wins the vote. It's the voices outside that are willing to stand up and educate. There is no one greater that will stand in the way to stand up for freedom when the masses think different. He's principled. He believes in the Constitution. But he as unwaveringly defends freedom each and every time. When others would think, oh, you're kind of going across the grain, what always happens is people come back because they know you're right and you're principled, and we thank you for doing that each and every day. <laughs> Mark is like a trumpeter who rallies people to the cause of freedom. And so many times when we take that vote, it was the hours that he educated the public to make us win the vote. You know, we see it time and again when he does it. I've seen it on a personal. I don't know about you, and I don't know if you paid attention. A lot of people win the speaker vote on the first round. 
Anybody can do it like that. A boxing match takes 15. But just like Israel, they have to fight to secure their freedom. But Mark's always in that corner. Just like my fight, you know who was educating the American public before I won the vote? It was Mark. I know this man. I could be a lot of places, and I get a lot of requests. But you made the two combination that I couldn't say no to. Your organization and nominating and honoring the man who truly is a hero. The award is named correctly for the man I admire and you too, who our countries would not be the same if he wouldn't stand up each and every day to millions of people across this nation tune in. Why? because he speaks the truth, he educates, and he stands firm. Those are the foundations of this organization. So Mark, if you can join me, so we can honor you, my friend, to get the Zionist Hero Award, Mark Levin. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. All right, the Zionist Hero Award presented to Mark Levin. How would you like to be this, to be known as the Great One? For your influential voice of truth about Israel and confronting anti-Semitism, Zionist Organization of America, Florida Region, honor you with the Hero Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you, man. I really appreciate it. Come join us. Come on. Yes. My wife. Get over here. Thank you, my friend. That's very kind of How's everybody doing? <clears throat> First, let me just say this about Kevin McCarthy. Is this man great or what? <laughs> it took him, what was it, four, five, 12 times? 15. Who's counting? Took Reagan three times to become president. And when you earn something like that, you appreciate it. And everybody doesn't win on the first ballot. Everybody doesn't win at the first try either. So when you earn something like that, it means something to you. I knew Kevin McCarthy was a man of deep moral principle who love this country and loves the state of Israel, because I got to know him. And to know him is to appreciate him greatly. And I don't know what we do without him in the House of Representatives and in Congress at this point, because there aren't very many others to look to, are there? I want to thank uh, Rabbi Goldberg for his fantastic place here. I want to thank uh, Mort and Rita. I want to thank Sharona. <laughs> congressman Bryan is my congressman. 
Congressman Carlos is a great guy. And most of all, I want to thank my family, my beautiful wife, Julie, my stepson, David, my beautiful mother-in-law, Sylvia. I'm 65. The first time I was in Israel, I was 60. But I loved it anyway. My parents told me to love the state of Israel. They'd never been to Israel either. But we knew about Israel, and we knew the history of Israel. We know the history of Judaism. And let me just say this. We are in trouble in two countries right now. And I'm not messing around. In this country, there's a political party that supports us, and there's one that doesn't. There's a political party that defends us, and there's one that doesn't. There's a political part, you don't like what I'm saying. There it is, the door. <laughs> There's a political party that celebrates and tolerates anti-Semites, and there's one that rejects it, period. There's a political party that supports the state of Israel, and there's one that does not. Ilhan Omar is the tip of the iceberg. This parental rights debate, where every single Democrat voted against the rights for parents to oversee how their children are going to be raised whether they're going to transition, whether they're going to see pornography, every one of them voted no against the bill. One of them was Hakeem Jeffries. And he got up and he said, the MAGA Republicans don't even want your kids to learn about the Holocaust. And I said, the MAGA Republicans know all about you, Hakeem. And we know about your uncle. And we know all about what you did at college and had your uncle there. And the vile, poisonous hatred he spewed against Jews like he did at the college that he was thrown out of. Nobody's thrown out of City College of New York, but he was. And Hakeem praised his uncle. They rewrite their history on the left. We have an administration that's meddling in Israel's internal affairs. They're sending surrogates and money to try and overthrow the current government of Israel. We have leftists in this country, including Jewish organizations, that are working with leftists in Israel to destroy that country as it stares down Iran, which is going to have nuclear weapons probably by the time this dinner is over. We have the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who goes before Congress 72 hours ago and says our objective is to prevent the Iranians from fielding nuclear weapons. I thought the objective was to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. The Biden administration turned the faucet back on where American tax dollars go to the Palestinians, despite the fact the Palestinians use those tax dollars in part to promote terrorism and give pensions to terrorists. The more Jews you kill, the bigger your pension. The prior administration cut it off. Biden administration has tried to put a Palestinian consulate in Jerusalem, even though there is an embassy in Jerusalem representing that part of the world. We are constantly on defense with this administration, constantly. And we're constantly looking over our shoulders 
at the other party. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in this country. It's at a level we've never seen in modern times. According to the ADL, and I'm no fan of the ADL, let me tell you. Am I Mort? Almost 4,000 incidents, over 110 that were violent. Has anybody heard the President of the United States speak out on this? Once? At all? Has anybody heard the Senate Majority Leader speak out about this? No, you haven't. Why? Think about it. We need to be stronger in our support of each other in the state of Israel than ever before because that little country is facing a rebellion. I wrote a book called American Marxism. Maybe the next book should be Israeli Marxism. There are forces in that country, just as there are forces in this country who hate it and want to overthrow it from within. You may not believe it, but it's true. There are also organizations in our country, putatively Jewish organizations, that are giving aid and comfort to the enemy. And then, of course, there's the enemy. We have Orthodox Jews who wear a certain kind of dress, typically in Brooklyn, New York, who are open season. Open season. When Black Lives Matter and Antifa were attacking our cities, the synagogues got the treatment with the swastikas painted on them. Anybody speak out about that? Look, here's the thing. Even the language is dumbed down. There is no West Bank. West Bank of what? <laughs> West Bank of Jordan? I think Jordan's the East Bank of Israel. <laughs> There's Judea, that may have a ring, and Samaria. And we are the indigenous peoples. The left in this country claims to always represent the indigenous peoples. Here we are. Now, the reason I'm so honored by this award and ZOA, because I don't go to many places, to be perfectly honest with you, drives my poor wife batty. First of all, I hate wearing ties. That's number one. <laughs> I'd be a great Orthodox Jew in Israel. They never wear ties. <laughs> but that said, because this organization is the only organization that I know that actually speaks the truth and defends the core beliefs of both the United States and Israel. Most people who hate Israel hate the United States, and most people who hate the United States hate Israel. You notice that? The leftists in Israel are very much like the leftists in the United States, don't you think? They just as soon burn down the country for power. Benjamin Netanyahu is Israel's Churchill. There's no better, there's no stronger, there's no smarter, there's no wiser. And thank God he is where he is right now, because that's exactly what they need. <laughs> Judicial reform. 
Why is that so controversial? Well, I'll tell you why it's controversial. Because <clears throat> the leftists who changed the government in Israel in the 1990s don't want to let go. That's why. And they didn't think that the people in Israel would ever vote other than for the parties on the left. The first to demonstrate that that wasn't going to be the case was Menachem Begin. One of the greatest prime ministers in the history of Israel. He would not bend knee to anybody, including Joe Biden in the United States Senate. And when ben Net Benjamin Netanyahu went to the joint session of Congress and said, no, we will not accept a deal that gives nukes to Iran, he wouldn't bend a knee either. I'll be very blunt with you. What's happening over there, as far as I'm concerned, is the European socialists who created that government don't want to let go of it. The founders of that government, not the country, don't want to let go of it. And so they transferred as much power to the court system as they possibly could. If you think our judiciary is out of control, you ain't seen nothing. You have the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Israel who's more powerful than the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, and the Knesset combined. Where did that come from? Nowhere. Barack, the original, he just decided it would come from him. So he develops what he calls a reasonableness test. So he sits there with the others and they decide if a law passed by the Knesset is reasonable. Being leftists, anything that's passed by leftists is reasonable, anything that's not is not. He's making battlefield decisions, decisions about who should be generals, decisions about who can sit in the Knesset, economic decisions, and they have no standing which means they can encourage leftists to bring these lawsuits that go to the Supreme Court because the court wants to impose its will on the people of Israel. It's already hard enough to cobble together a coalition in that country. They decided to adopt the government of Italy, which was a big mistake in my opinion, with all these little parties and so forth making decisions about who will and won't be in power. Now that said, Minority parties have a lot of say in Israel, of the right and left and all over the place, because they have to really be part of the governing majority, depending on who can cobble together a majority overall. So the idea that there's a two-party system in Israel, there's not a two-party system in Israel. There's a 25-party system in Israel. And so everybody has a say at some point about something. Even the Arab parties who want to destroy Israel. They get a say. So what's with this super powerful judiciary? It's a Politburo, it's not a judiciary. Where they sit around and decide from on high what's going to happen in the state of Israel. And they and the minority parties and the party that lost are using every power they can think of, money from the United States State Department, the United States President of the United States, the United States Secretary of Defense, the United States Secretary of State, all these NGOs, all these left-wing secular groups, I guess I'll call them, sellouts is what I call them on the radio, uh, and others, and now the labor unions, the IDF reservists, to raise up, to rise up, excuse me, and demand that this government in Israel resign or surrender on the issue of the judiciary. And of course, like most Marxists, they claim to do this on behalf of the people. 
Well, the problem that the government of Israel has right now is Iran, because they've never been closer to war with Iran. Iran has never been closer to China, and Iran has never been closer to Russia, and Iran has never been closer to Saudi Arabia. They have a hell of a problem on their hands. They've got a virtual civil war at home and a virtual war with Iran, and that's no tiny country. So it is important to understand what is going on there, in my view. And in our own country, we're in a hell of a mess here. The man in the Oval Office, who was the dumbest man in the Senate, now he's the dumbest man in the Oval Office. <laughs> the Chinese are preparing for war. Did you hear me? They are preparing for war. They're building alliances all over the world. They're taking allies from us. They're taking bases from us, the Solomon Islands. My great uncle fought at Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. For all I know, he fought over that deep water port. It's now a Chinese leased port. Both ends of the Panama Canal are effectively controlled by communist China. They are threatening Japan over disputed islands. They're threatening the Philippines over disputed islands. Actually, those, those islands aren't even disputed. They are uh, threatening Australia. And we have, and I'm just going to tell you this, we have people in our country who think we're the warmongers. And some of them are Republicans. We have people in our country who believe we're spending too much on defense. Biden's budget is a 19% increase for the EPA and a 3% increase for the Defense Department when you have inflation at 7, 8, 9%. While communist China is on the rise. That's nuts. We have people who say Russia's not the problem. China's the problem. That's like saying in the lead up to World War II, Japan's not the problem, Italy's the problem. Or Italy's not the problem, Germany's the problem. Germany's not the problem. It, are you kidding me? They're doing it in front of our faces. They're building an access. And one other thing, as I ramble on here. Thank God for the men and women in Ukraine. And let me tell you why. Because it is they who are preventing World War III, not the other way around. Because Putin planned to cut through Ukraine in a week. And if you heard what he said and read what he wrote in July of 2021, he made it clear that the boundaries of Poland needed to be adjusted. Why do you think Poland's pouring everything it has into Ukraine? Why do you think Romania is pouring everything it has into Ukraine? Finland, that was neutral through World War II, is pouring everything it has into Ukraine. Lithuania, pouring everything it has into Ukraine. Moldova sitting there, one and a half million people. They have a police force. Why do you think Eastern Europe is scared to death? And now Western Europe, even the Germans are rebuilding their military. Are they warmongers too? We give equipment and we give money to the Ukrainians and they're fighting for their survival. What are they supposed to do? They were invaded. Surrender? Roll over and play dead? And I want you to think about something. We Jews, I want us to think about something. How many times have you seen those black and white films from World War II with the trains, with the buildings being blown up, with people being sent to camps? And how many times have you said, where was the world? Well, what the hell do you think the Ukrainians are thinking? 
when tens of thousands of their children are being trained from Ukraine into Russia, never to be seen again, or the stories about the mass rape and the butchery and the beheadings and the stories about how men, I won't tell you here, what they're doing, the Russians, to these Ukrainian citizens. Ukraine's not firing missiles into Russia. Russia's firing missiles into Ukraine. Mark, what does it have to do with us? God, you tell them. What does it have to do with us? Everything. Either we're a moral people or we're not. Either we have allies, we stand for them, and they stand for us. That doesn't mean every battle is our battle, but it doesn't mean no battle is our battle. I want you to listen to what Ronald Reagan said in 1964 about how we would rather die fighting than living on our knees. That's what we Americans do. Every war is in Afghanistan. Every war is not a forever war. World War II was four and a half years, long, hard years. That wasn't a forever war. There are forever wars, and there are wars that are not forever. It's hard to know in advance. But I will tell you this. As I've told my family, as I've told my audiences, Ukraine, those people are heroes. The president of Ukraine, I don't care how much they're trashed by people on my own network. I don't give a damn. The president of Ukraine is a Jew. His family is Jewish. He lost family members in the Holocaust. And I have to hear that he supports neo-Nazis? That's crap. They're fighting for their survival. There's only one country of those two that's threatened us with nukes. It's not Ukraine. I just point that out wherever I can and whenever I can. In this period of isolationism, It's very dangerous. When Hitler was rising, he was a big fan of Mussolini. Tojo was rising. Same thing. What's that have to do with us? Nothing. People being killed over there. What's that have to do with us? Nothing. They keep building up their militaries. Both the Republicans and the Democrats in the United States were isolationists led by Lindbergh, the American First Project. What's that have to do with us? Nothing. And we lost more human beings because we weren't prepared for what we saw with our own two eyes, what we heard with our own two ears, than we had to. Because we had to play defense in order to go on offense. Those of you who are here, obviously you can't see my show tonight, and I ask tonight what I ask on TV. What's it gonna take? What's it gonna take for this country to wake the hell up and build up its military and prepare for the new access of evil? I'm not saying we go on offense, but we're not ready. We're not ready psychologically, and we're not ready militarily. We can't have the greatest military on the face of the earth if the civilians don't support the military. We have the weakest Secretary of Defense, the weakest Joint Chiefs, the weakest President, the weakest Secretary of State in my lifetime, maybe forever, while the enemies are on the move. They're on the move. And China is going to invade Taiwan. What are we going to do? What can we do? If you want to keep your kids and grandkids out of war, I suggest we build up our military now. 
we get some smart diplomacy going now. Because otherwise, there will be a World War III. And the enemy is in our hemisphere right now. The Chinese have about a score bases in Central and South America. They don't call them bases, but they're bases. Their fleet is bigger than our fleet. Under Reagan, we had a 600-ship Navy. Today, we have a 285-ship Navy. And it's shrinking, isn't it, Mr. Speaker? We're not meeting our recruitment numbers because our young people want nothing to do with this woke crap. They can get that in school. Why join the military for that? We are in a very weakened position. And I, look, you don't have to believe me, but the communist Chinese know it. The Iranians are testing us as I speak with the missiles going back and forth. What do you think Reagan would have done to Iran? What do you think Trump would have done with Iran? Think they would have put up with this? So, one of the reasons to circle back that I am proud to be here with you tonight and proud to re receive this award is number one, I'm here with, with a great man, Kevin McCarthy. Or Klein, Sharona, all of you folks, I want to thank you because you have something better to do on Sunday nights, I know, like watch me. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, not really. Um, and I get the emails and I get the notices from ZOA on a regular basis and they're very, very important. And I want to thank you. So God bless America. God bless Israel. God bless Speaker McCarthy and what he's doing. And God bless you. Wow. So how about that? We got the Mark Levin Show live here tonight. Let's hear it again for our Zionist hero. Thank you so much to everyone who's been donating so far. Keep it coming. I don't know anyone who speaks with Mort's with ZOA National President Mort Klein's type of conviction, unapologetic conviction when it comes to Israel. Please welcome to the stage ZOA Florida board member Lauren Gross. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Morton, thank you. Morton A. Klein is the national president of ZOA, the oldest pro-Israel group in the United States. Founded in 1897, ZOA played a key role in the Jewish state's reestablishment. Today, ZOA, with Mort Klein at the helm, is the leading major American Jewish organization courageously defending Israel and the Jewish people fighting against all forms of anti-Semitism, including anti-Jewish boycotts, and promoting the Jewish people's lawful right to live and settle historic Jewish lands. Mort Klein and ZOA spearheaded the battle to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Thank you, Mort. Mort Klein is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunsberg, Germany. He is an economist who served in the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations. More recently, he has been invited to testify before Congress and in the Israeli Knesset. He has been named one of the top Jewish activists of the century, one of the top 10 Jewish leaders, and one of the best minds in the country. 
Mort Klein has been quoted internationally, and more than 300 of his articles and letters have been published around the world. He has also appeared on every single major television network. Quoting from the Wall Street Journal, when the history of the American Jewish struggle in these years is written, Mr. Klein will emerge as an outsized figure. The New York Times has called Mort Klein, quote, a man who ferrets out anti-Semitism wherever it is, a rare voice from the outset in the American Jewish community against the Oslo Accords, and an, and an iconoclast who is a prolific speechmaker, writer, and congressional lobbyist. I am incredibly honored to introduce the man whom the Times of Israel calls America's most important Jew, Morton A. Klein. Well, thank you, Lauren, for that <clears throat> very generous introduction. <clears throat> I asked Sharona if I could follow Speaker McCarthy and uh, Michael Levin. I thought that would be good for me. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> well, I, I want to, before I begin, I'd like to show the map of the Middle East to remind all of us how tiny, tiny Israel is. The orange countries you see are the 23, 22 Arab countries. The little yellow in the center is Israel. The Arab world is 800 times the size of Israel. And yet the world is saying the only way to peace is land for peace. And who has to give up the land? So just remember how tiny Israel is, uh, despite the fact it's in the newspapers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> All of you here, simply by attending this extraordinary, truly extraordinary superstar gala with my dear friends, Mark Levin and Speaker McCarthy, shows clearly that you in this room are strong, proud, courageous activist Zionists, that you are as committed and love the Jewish state of Israel as much as we at the ZOA do. And as far as I'm concerned, you in this room are all pro-Israel honorees, all of you here. <laughs> ZOA is virtually alone in publicly pushing back against and criticizing the unjust, unfair, and irrational hostility some U.S. administrations and some members of Congress display toward the Jewish state. This week and weeks before, this U.S. administration and some members of Congress displayed toward this Jewish state incredible hostility. <laughs> they have railed against Israel's judicial reform plan, <laughs> which is a domestic internal Israeli matter that America should never, ever have anything to say about, ever interfere with. And you know, the State Department is funding radical groups in Israel to fight against the judicial reform plan. <laughs> Did Israel ever get involved in attacking America for the proposal after proposal by Democrats to increase the Supreme Court to 13 members of the Supreme Court? Did Israel say a word? No, nor should they. And America should not be interfering with this internal matter. <laughs> and while they condemn Israel for this, this administration doesn't say a word about the Palestinian Authority refusing to have elections since 2005, which has turned the Palestinian Authority into a fascist terrorist dictatorship. But, uh, but this administration says nothing about that. <laughs> 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 this administration criticizes Israel's building Jewish homes on less than 10% of Judea and Samaria, yet says nothing about the fact that the Palestinian Authority continues to build homes in the Israel-controlled Judea and Samaria Area C and in eastern Jerusalem. Biden says not a word about that. <laughs> U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Tom Nides, 
one of the worst ambassadors we've ever had for Israel, <laughs> says he won't meet with any Jew past the Green Line, past Judean, in Judean Samaria. There's over a half a million Jews there. He says, I won't meet with them. Yet he meets with Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian terrorist leaders in Judea and Samaria all the time. That's not a problem for him. <laughs> the U.S. criticizes Israel for not promoting a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, yet says nothing about this potential Palestinian state continuing to this minute to pay lifetime pensions to Arabs to murder Jews. Lifetime pensions. And the pension is five times the average salary of a Palestinian Arab. It is very lucrative to murder Jews, and Biden says not a word about it. And Tom Nides, who I confronted in Israel three weeks ago, says not a public word about it. And he says to me, oh, Mort, I bring it up in private meetings all the time. But he's not leaving, he and Biden are not leaving things private when they criticize Israel, are they? <laughs> they say nothing about the fact that this Palestinian Authority, while criticizing Israel, about the Palestinian Authority names schools, streets, sports teams, children's camps, after Jew killers, honoring and glorifying people who murder Jews. <laughs> that they have posters of every Jew killer put up in the high schools and colleges in the Palestinian Authority, honoring and glorifying people who have murdered Jews. Has President Biden said a word about this horror? Has Tom Nide said a word about this horror? Instead, they've given $800 million of our taxpayer money to the Palestinian Authority and $700 million to UNRWA, a vicious anti-Semitic outfit, <laughs> despite the fact that they pay people to murder Jews. And we have a law that says if you continue paying people to murder Jews, you can't get any money. Donald Trump stopped every penny to the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> the U.S. criticizes Israel's Minister of Finance, who said there's never been such a place as an Arab-Palestine state. And they condemned him bitterly for saying that, even though it's true. Yet he says nothing about Abbas, who says the Jews' filthy feet should never be allowed on the Temple Mount, and that the Jews have no right to even one inch of Israel or the Temple Mount. <laughs> Or he says nothing about the fact that the Palestinian Authority's maps in the schools, colleges, and their business offices, and their governmental offices show all of Israel as Palestine. But Biden and Nides and Blinken say nothing about this, but they're quick to condemn Israel for nonsense. <laughs> the administration criticizes Israeli Minister of Finance when in the moment of emotional grief and misery, when two family friends were murdered by, Palis by Palestinians from the Hawara town, which is a terrorist enclave filled with jihadists. And he said, we should wipe this town out when they murdered two of his family friends. <laughs> Within a day, he apologized for the statement, for this remark. Even though Hawara has people living there continuously shooting from their, their area there in Hawara into Route 60 at Jews, shooting them, injuring them, killing them regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Yet the Biden administration says nothing about the fact that the Palestinian Authority Prime Minister, Mohammed Shteya, glorifies and praises these very terrorists, these very terrorist attacks against Jews, urges sanctions against Israel, and accuses Israel of war crimes. The Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, nothing from Biden. <laughs> and he doesn't condemn the fact that Abbas's Fatah constitution, the charter, the constitution of Abbas's Palestinian Arab Party, says, quote, we oppose any political solution offered as an alternative to demolishing the Zionist state. And armed public revolution is the only method to liberate Palestine. That's their official charter, official constitution. Not a word about that. But when a minister in grief of his friends being murdered 
says this town should be wiped out and then apologizes. He gets condemned and attacked and said he shouldn't be allowed to remain in the government. He ignores the fact, Biden and Blinken and Nides, that recent polls in the last month show that 71% of Palestinian Arabs support the recent murder of the brothers in Israel who've been murdered. Support it. 68% support armed terror groups to kill Israelis. This is in the last few weeks. 83% oppose ending the existing Arab terrorist groups. 87% says the Palestinian Authority has no right to arrest anyone in the Arab terror groups. And 74% oppose Israel's existence as a state, even if they get one. Even if they get one. <laughs> Yet Biden and Blinken and Nides and our government says nothing, nothing about this. This unjust double standard of judging differently Jews and the Jewish state to Muslims and the Palestinian Arab state, this double standard must be condemned and must end. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make a very strong statement. There's a name for this kind of double standard when it comes to Jews and non-Jews. That name for this double standard is called one thing. It's called anti-Semitism. That's what it's called. <laughs> I want to mention a few words about the reforms. There are many of the reforms you don't know about that are very important, that are being condemned by the United States and others. The reforms call for a death penalty for convicted murderers, which Israel doesn't have now. <laughs> they, they call for deporting any convicted Palestinian terrorists after they leave prison to deport them out of the country of Israel. <laughs> they want reforms that Jews on the Temple Mount have the same rights as Muslims on the Temple Mount to pray there to pray there. And the left in Israel says, no, this will offend. This will offend and provoke the Arabs, the Muslims. We can't have this. Would anyone ever say back in the 60s, we can't have blacks moving into a white suburb because it'll offend those whites? Never. We did what's right. We said, no, everyone should have equal rights to live wherever they want to live and wherever they can afford. And Jews in the Temple Mount who wish to pray there, should be allowed to pray there. Remember, this is called the Temple Mount, not the Mosque Mount. This is where our temple was built, our first and second temple. <laughs> and they have reforms that aren't talked about, that they want to give police and the IDF less restrictions in fighting terrorists and defending Israeli citizens, less restrictions on Israeli police. <laughs> And the law of return, you don't hear about this. This is a critical issue. They want to ch this government in Israel wants to change the law of return. They want to end the grandparent clause. Right now, if you have one grandparent who's Jewish, you can automatically become a come to Israel and become a citizen. One grandparent. These people aren't Jewish by any religi Jewish religious movement's definition. And what's happened because of this clause, over half the people last year who moved into Israel under uh, the, the law of return are not Jewish. Over half of the people making Aliyah are not Jewish. There are 500,000 non-Jews now from Russia living in Israel. 72% of the Russians moving to Israel are not Jewish. And of all those coming in under the grandparent clause, how many do you think are convert? When I talk to my leftist friends, they say, oh, they'll, they'll all be converting. Do you know what percentage are converting? 13%, one three. 13% are converting. <laughs> Their Jewish girlfriends are demanding they convert. <laughs> 30 years ago, 84% of the people of Israel were Jewish. 30 years later, today, 73% are Jewish. We're losing 1% every three years. Another couple of generations, Israel will not be a Jewish state. This is a critical issue that we must support to end the grandparent clause. And, and American uh, religious groups, reform, conservative, reconstructionists, they're opposed to changing this. Even though, do you know how many people from America 
came to Israel in the last 10 years under the grandparent clause? 67. Six or seven every year. That's it. It doesn't affect the, uh, anything to do with reform uh, or reconstructions or conservative Jewish movements. We have to support this. And of course, the biggest issue that Mark Levin so capably and ably explained in a clear way that you will not read in the New York Times or Washington Post or Miami Herald. <laughs> As Mark Levin explained, there's no standing. Anybody can sue in the Supreme Court. They want to have standing. It has to affect you directly. <laughs> Number two, it's so important. The way Supreme Court justices are chosen, they're chosen now by a committee with three Supreme Court justices, two members of the American Bar Association, two ministers, and two Knesset members. You need seven of those nine to approve a justice. That means the, the three Supreme Court justices who are all liberal can veto it because you need seven out of nine. Three alone can veto it. And the two Bar Association members always vote with the Supreme Court justices on the committee because they go before them and they don't want to upset them. So what happens is you have almost all liberal left-wing members of the Supreme Court uh, as judges. You have virtually no conservatives, and it continues to be liberals because this system is ridiculous. And Israel wants to make it more democratic. They want elected officials to decide who is on the Supreme Court. Just like we in America have the elected president who chooses to uh, nominate someone, then the Senate has to approve. All these are elected officials. So, all Israel wants to do is make things more democratic, not less democratic, as the left wing is lying and lying and lying. <laughs> and of course, what about the issue, as Mark discussed, uh, of overturning Supreme Court law, which on its face seems a little uncomfortable? Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. The Supreme Court of Israel caused Israeli, this government, to, to have a situation where they want to overturn Supreme Court rulings. How did the Supreme Court create a situation where this becomes an imperative? Because dozens of times, this Supreme Court of Israel, since the mid-90s, <clears throat> overrule Israeli law, overrule black and white Knesset law. They're not allowed to overrule law. They have to follow the law and interpret it, not overrule it. And as Mark Levin explained, Aharon Barak in the mid-90s comes up with this insane theory. This is a complicated legal theory. Reasonableness? Even I understand reasonableness. He's saying if the Supreme Court thinks a law that Israeli Knesset passed is not reasonable, we will overturn it and ignore it. I mean, obviously, what he thinks is reasonable doesn't mean I do. What I think is reasonable doesn't mean he, he does. This is an absurd law. Where was the media screaming against this, this uh, uh, revolution when it happened in the mid-'90s? So because the Knesset overturns Israeli law, let me give you two quick examples. There's a law in Israel, if you're an activist BDS member, that activist promoting BDS, you can't come to Israel. So Israel has stopped... Omar and Tlaib, for example, from entering Israel. NGOs went to the Supreme Court, said, you know, we think this is not right. The Supreme Court says, you know, that law not allowing BDS activists into Israel, that's not reasonable. Let him in. Let him in. <laughs> There's a law in Israel, if you're a racist party or show sympathy for terrorism, you can't run in office. You can't be a party. Two Arab parties, Balad and Ra'am, the Israel Communist Party are racist and they've shown sympathy for terrorism. They try, Knesset tried to stop them from running. They went to the Supreme Court, they said, that's not reasonable. They should be allowed to run. I don't care about this law because this law is not reasonable to me. And they let him, and, and they let him run. <laughs> and there are many other uh, such laws. That's why now uh, we, Israel has gone from the Israeli public 15 years ago, 70% supported the Supreme Court. Now only 40% support the Supreme Court. And 75% support the, these judicial reforms. These reforms are taking Israel from an extreme, maniacal, absurd situation to a normal, legitimate situation. Not like the left says it's going from, from normal to extreme. It's going from extreme to normal. 
These reforms are reasonable, legitimate, and appropriate and necessary measures. And we should all be supporting this. You notice <laughs> <laughs> the newspapers or media never tell you the reason for this is because the Supreme Court ignores black and white Israeli law. <laughs> I will end by saying, quoting Mark Twain on the Jews, have a little inspiration. <laughs> If the statistics are right, said Mark Twain, the Jews constitute but one quarter of 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people. And his importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of the Jewish people's bulk. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are very out of proportion to the weakness of the Jewish people's numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. <laughs> the Babylonians and others filled the planet with sound and splendor, then they faded to dream stuff and passed away. Others followed, made a vast noise, there soon were gone. Others have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but have burned out. They sit in twilight now, and they have vanished, so many peoples. Yet the Jews saw them all, the Jews survived them all, and the Jew is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert but aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains. So we must be strong. Be not afraid, for God and truth is with the Jewish people in Israel. The cause of Israel is moral and just. We must act and speak out with courage. God is on our side. With your help, with the strength and will of the Israeli people, with the strength and strength and the will of the IDF, with the help of Almighty God, Miracles will be occurring to save us that we can't foresee. And the people of Israel shall dwell in their holy land for eternity. In this Pesach coming up, we read that in every generation, the Passover of God foresees enemies will rise up against the Jewish people. And that's exactly what's happened. But each time enemies have risen up throughout thousands of years of our history, we have risen, overcome our enemies, destroyed our enemies. <laughs> Fifty years in the future, I believe will be a time of regeneration, hope, new opportunities, and stronger Jewish communities. The Torah promises, the Torah, Hashem, promises that Israel is the Jewish homeland and that Israel will always be a Jewish homeland and the Jewish people will always survive and be here. The Torah and God says we will be an eternal people. And unlike politicians, unlike most politicians, God creeps keeps his promises, and the Jewish people and Eretz Yisrael will surely prevail. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.